Welcome to a brand new episode of Radical Math Talk, the show for the revolutionaries in math education. I'm your host, Kwame Salfamensa. And if this is your first time tuning in to this podcast, I welcome you and I hope that today's episode is one that you will find informative, enlightening, and insightful. And for those who are coming back and are returning listeners and viewers of the podcast, um, as always, thank you for your support. And I also hope that this episode is one that you will find informative, enlightening, and of course, insightful. So before we get into the main event, if you're on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Yes, the red subscribe button. And that will give you future notifications on new episodes of both the Identity Talk for Educators Live podcast and the Radical Math Talk podcast. Uh, we also accept any monetary donations that will help us continue to build the Identity Talk podcast. So if you are somebody who is on Cash App, you can donate uh, with our handle, money sign ID Talk for Ed. And if you're on Venmo, uh, you can donate through our handle at Kwame SM. So that's K W A M E S M. Thank you kindly. All right, y'all. So we got ourselves another uh, dope conversation that's about to come up. Um, and today's guest is somebody who is all about student voice. So who's all about making sure that we are centering the cultures of our students and using that context as a way to drive our instruction. And someone who believes that, you know, math is a verb, which I believe as well. You know, you got to do the math in order to, you know, really be great at it. So it's all about the action. And she's also about that action. So uh, without further ado. I want to bring on Crystal Marie Watson to the podcast to talk with us about how she gets up in that action. So let's get into it. Crystal, what's up? Hey, the whole government name. I love it. Thank you. Hey, <laughs> got respect it, right? Absolutely. I love it. So what's going on? How you feeling? You know what? Um... I know people expect folks to say fine when you ask them, but I'm feeling a little heavy. It's been a it's been a hard couple weeks, um, but I'm excited. This is like therapy to me to talk to somebody with someone that shares um, some of the same ideals and theology that I do. So I'm I'm excited for this time with you. All right, I thought you were still heavy because of that Bengals loss of the Super Bowl, but maybe don't play. You don't do that. <laughs> Talk I'm sorry. You gave me, yeah, you gave me the alley oop. I'm sorry. You gave me the alley oop. We didn't get beat, beat. I mean, we just got beat. You know. <laughs> I actually thought they were gonna win. Um, and I don't really watch football like that anymore because you know I've been boycotting, you know, yeah. Kaepernick, all that. But yeah. I just thought the way this team was with the swag, you know, Joe Burrow and everything. I just thought, all right, they got Thank a shot to. They, they got a shot to do something special. So. They'll be yeah. back and they'll win. So. They're young. They'll be Just back. Keep watching. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, before we get into the the main um, conversation, you know, let's talk about, you know, you. So, you know, you are, you know, from Cincinnati. Yep. The Natty. I am. And, yeah. Tell me about, you know, that upbringing and really how did math come into your life. So with this mathography, you know, it's about just sharing your journey and how you've been able to evolve with math from the time that you learned it in school all the way up until the way that you're interacting with it right now. So just kind of walk us through that journey. Um, I will say I I'm a late math adopter. Um, I, I'm a lot like the students that I teach and I get to interact with on a daily basis where I'm not, I was never terrible at math, but I was never like that person that they were, they were pushing to take calc to or anything like that, or like be an engineer. Right. So I just remember math just kind of being, it was another subject in school that I had to take. I knew I needed four credits to get out of school and that was it. 
Um, I, I didn't have anybody really affirm me in math. I've grown up in Cincinnati. I went to Cincinnati public schools up until middle school. And then I moved to a suburb. And in that suburb, there weren't very many black or brown students. Uh, so it was very dominant culture oriented in so many ways. And I know we'll, we'll probably get into that later, but I, I didn't feel, I felt even less affirmed in that space. I went to undergrad at, um, Northern Kentucky university and I had a professor, her name is Dr. Couch, Dr. Joyce Couch. And I remember testing and I tested into a pre, like a remedial math class, Right. And again, I had never, I've never thought of myself being math dumb or anything like that. So I was like, you know, why, where, where did this come from? Why am I not taking college algebra like everybody else, right? So I get into the class and Dr. Couch is telling me, you know this, like you're, you're picking this up. So you've seen this before. And just her affirming me and seeing another black woman doing math was mind blowing for me anyway. Her affirming me through that process, letting me know that I do have brilliance. I just had it hadn't been brought out in a way that made sense for me yet. Um, and it's sad that I had to wait until, you know, almost 20 years old to feel that. But she ended up having me co-teach with her. She had me teach her supplemental, um, like a almost like a tutoring class where I led the class. They had to take that tutoring kind of supplemental space um, with their rem remedial math class. And since then, I was like, you know what? I can do anything. I don't, you can put anything in front of me. If I want to do it, I'm going to make it happen. Wow. So that's kind of how I ended up here. <laughs> it just took that for you to believe in yourself. Yep. Like for somebody to make it plain and clear to me, like you can do this. It's not something that just people that want to be doctors or engineers or lawyers or whatever, you know, anybody that wants to go to college, math isn't just for college. So just having somebody really shine that light for me was, was heavy. It was, it was a lot for me. Wow. And I just wonder how come we don't do that enough for our students? You know, it's not rocket science. You know, why doesn't that happen more frequently? Hmm. You want the Crystal Watson answer or you want the Educator Crystal M. Watson. <laughs> Come on. We we I'm here for the real. So you already know I want the former. <laughs> I mean, we're all steeped in white supremacy culture and we operate within it, and education isn't any different. So we focus on, you know, what right answers instead of like conceptual understanding. We focus on power structures that have been set up by elite white men. And it's no different in, in education. We are not an, an anomaly. We, right. We're part of that system. So that's why. Well, there it is. <laughs> so I guess we might as well jump right in, right? So, that's right. so here, the show your work segment. Uh, this is where you're pretty much letting us know the receipts. So these are three words that we always say to our students in math class. Whenever they come up to us, to our desk, and they have their work for us to grade. We see those right answers, but no evidence, um, no reasoning, no explanation as to how they got there. Mm -hmm. Show your work. Yeah. How do I know how you got these answers? And it's not that you're cheating. I need to know how you're thinking about these concepts. I need to know if you truly understand, because as you mentioned, growing up, we focus so much on the answer yeah. And we just ignore the process, how we got there. And I think that kind of speaks to this idea of conceptual understanding versus your procedural understanding. Mm -hmm. Well, just give me the algorithm and formula. I can follow yeah. the steps to get the answer, but I can't tell you why these steps need to be followed. Yep. What's the rationale for those steps? Right. So, so tell me this. Thinking about your own experience um, in K to twelve as a math learner, and and just kind of thinking about the work you're doing now as a math coach, what, how do we learn who our students are as math learners? 
How do we go about doing that? So first of all, listen and observe more than we talk. Uh, we've got to center students. I, I always think of Dr. Child's thoughts around circular teaching. So like having your, your classroom should look like a circle where the students are centered and everybody's culture can be in the middle at any given time. So like we're not centering white supremacy culture. We're not centering the teacher. Um, we're not doing any of that. So I, I feel like that is the first step. But before cracking open any books, any curricula, any of that, the first thing I always do, and I encourage teachers to do this as I coach, is, and then throughout the, the year as well, you should always um, stop and, and just recalibrate relationships, is really giving students an opportunity to reflect on where they've been in math, where they currently are and where they want to go. And I would even argue to say, I care more about them as a person and getting to know them as a person as opposed to them as a math doer, right? Mm -hmm. Because if I know you as a person, I can probably tweak some of the math to help you be a math doer, right? So at the beginning of the year, I have kids give me um, their math stories and they can do that in many a ways. I've had kids write me raps. I've had poetry. I've had um, literally stories. I've had them do comic books just to tell me kind of where they've been, how they felt, how they feel in their brains and their bodies when they do math. Like, are they anxious? Are they excited? Do they get depressed? How do you feel both physically and mentally when math is put in front of you? And then I also weave in work with their support systems. So whether that be a parent, a guardian, someone that is invested in their success, I have them interview them first thing, first thing in the year and ask them, what are your goals and dreams and aspirations for me as a learner? And then I have them reflect on those goals and aspirations and dreams and set some for themselves. Nice. And I, I ask their support person to tell me if there's something that I can do as Mrs. Watson to help them be a better math learner. Because even if you are like this big, you know, you see yourself as a math learner already, you have room to grow, right? So I just always ask that question so that I can tailor the experience to every single student as individuals. Ooh, wow. And <laughs> I do the same exact thing and I actually call it the mathography. That's what, yes. I, that's what I call it. And they would, you know, tell me their stories. Mm -hmm. What are your traumas that you bring to the classroom? Um, all interrelated. Yeah. All in, yep. And then just tell me about your family. Tell me about your hopes, your dreams, just everything. Because in the end, that anecdotal information can be useful when you're trying to modify a lesson, mm. when you're creating a project, when you're able to shape those things around the experiences of your students. That's what brings the engagement yes. um, up to a higher level. And it's just crazy how, you know, we spend so much time in the beginning of the year focusing strictly on diagnostic assessments. Not to say that we shouldn't do that. We should, we should still do it, but that's just one piece of data. You and know, not that, even the most important piece. No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Not by a long shot. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Yeah. But it, it's just crazy how we, we overemphasize that data. And then I know when I was teaching in Boston, it was that day the, that we used to um, help, you know, craft our goals. Cause we had to write our goals for the year in terms of how students are going to grow. Yep. Are they going to grow by 15%? Are they going to grow by 20%? Still 25? the same. Still the same. We still do that. You, you know, and it's <laughs> like, okay. I'm going to say 15 this year because I'm going to have to put in that work. Yes. It's going to be a grind. So I'm not going to play myself and say 30%. Let me go ahead and put 15% because I know that we're going to have to take our time and and really um, do this work. And this, and this kind of segues into just this idea of white supremacy culture uh, manifesting itself, you know, in the math classroom. So... Mm. Um, in my other podcast, I had a chance to interview uh, Dr. Tima Okun, mm -hmm. um, who, for those who don't know, um, 
wrote an article years ago about the characteristics of white supremacy culture. And there's about like 14 of them. We're not going to name all of them right now. But as we go into this conversation, we're definitely going to weave some of those characteristics in. Yep. And when I um, interviewed her and I started to study her work, I thought about my own experience as a math teacher, but also as a math student. And I'm just like, wow. Like I'm seeing how these characteristics are showing up yes. in the every math day. classroom mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. So what I'm, interested is, what I'm interested in knowing from you is just from your experience, how do you see those characteristics of white supremacy culture manifesting itself in the math classroom specifically? Um, so that could be a whole show on its own. I just want you to know that. So I feel like Cliff Note version. Let's yeah, do you set me up. But that's okay. So I'm gonna give you a sound bite of it. Um, so so many ways. It, it, I mean, you just talked about it. 14 ways, right? So I I think about Stride One in the Equitable uh, Teaching Cool, the Equitable Toolkit. Um, it looks at equitable math instruction. Mm -hmm. Stride One focuses on dismantling white supremacy culture in mathematics. I have combed through Stride One. We've walked through it in my district. Um, in my district, Cincinnati Public Schools, um, the entire math department is Black. The math department manager is Black. The coaches are Black. Um, so we're, and we have some, we have some really, really dope teaching staff across our district. So like nice. that really wants to make it work for the 78% of our students that do not identify as white. Uh, so we're, we've been, we've been unpacking stride one, but all of that to say, so if we do not work intentionally to push against it, we're all perpetuating them, right? So I just want to preface that with, with preface what I'm about to say with that. Sure. But when we focus greater on what the right answer is, as opposed to how our students got there, what they're thinking is, their ways of knowing. So Cincinnati Public, we are really, our highest growing population is our English language learning population. Mm. And while most of them were born here, they are first generation American born citizens. Their parents, the our highest growing population, their parents were born in other places where education may have looked different in those places. They may have felt different in those places and the way that they learned, their ways of knowing, their ways of communicating what they've learned, applying what they've learned and really just living life looks different. So when we continue to, well, that's not the right answer. No, go away, go try it again. And it's it's always on that right answer, white supremacy culture. Mm. Let's say when we force students to show their work in a pres prescribed fashion. So I remember in third grade, my son, he's in fifth grade now, third grade, he was given all of these different um, ways to show his work. He chose one on a test and that's not the one that they wanted to see on the test. So they marked him wrong, even though yeah. his answer was right. Like, lady, you can't, you cannot grade my son off of a strategy. You can grade, if it's right or wrong, clearly, but his thinking was completely right. His strategy was fine. It's just not the one that you had taught that week. White supremacy culture, oh. right? So just the ways that we continue to, to steep ourselves and our students in that culture is, is abysmal. But when the teacher is... I think the biggest one is when the teacher is centered as the keeper of knowledge, right? So like, I'm the teacher, so I'm gonna tell you how to do this math. Um, one thing that I really pride myself on as a teacher is going in and telling my students, I was never, I was a C student in math, all through school. So guess what? There's gonna be some things where I'm gonna have aha moments from you all, because you're gonna show me strategies that I was not taught because I was taught differently. You're going to show me all these different strategies that you learned in your third and fourth and fifth grade classrooms. And I'm seventh and eighth grade teacher. So you're going to sh show me all of these strategies and I'm going to learn from you. And sometimes it was as easy as saying, hey, if, if I'm teaching you math, let's stay after school and you teach me Spanish. I literally had a student, Carlos, that said, if, if I let you teach me math, you got to let me teach you Spanish. And I was like, oh, bet. Say less. Let's do it. And that's literally what we did. 
So just really honoring ways of knowing, um, honoring that students are not empty vessels just because they don't know how to conjugate something or they don't know how to, you know, plug and play into a, a, a formula or they don't know how to solve a, a linear equation yet doesn't mean that they don't know something, right? So just really honoring that everybody in the space is a keeper of knowledge and an expert in something. Ooh, that was probably <laughs> the most succinct and profound way of explaining white supremacy culture in math classroom. And as you were explaining, I heard all the characteristics in those examples. Like I heard them all when you were talking about just being like the keeper of knowledge and you're the empty vessels, meaning the students, that's paternalism. That's power hoarding. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's basically it. And basically, and this is what Paulo Freire talks about in the Pedagogy of the Press, where he talks about the banking Absolutely. method. Yep. Where it's like that same dynamic. All I'm doing is depositing, and there's nothing else. I'm not. I'm. I'm not withdrawing anything from you. I'm just. I'm the depositor all the time. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Exactly. And then even like with language where we focus so much on just the the writing in mathematics, but we don't allow for space for students to demonstrate their knowledge in different ways. You know, you're talking about worship of the written word, right? Absolutely. You know, you have students, emerging, emerging bilingual students who are still building their capacity in English. Just because they're not able to to speak English to the level that you expect them to doesn't mean that they don't have the math capacity, but you got to give them the opportunities to show it. And that's where we look at the one right way, the prescribed methods that like everything is tied together. Absolutely. Everything is tied together. And yet we still are giving students standardized assessments that <laughs> perpetuate those very characteristics we're speaking of and how can we truly dismantle white supremacy culture when we put so much merit on these tests that perpetuate those characteristics of the culture they were built to weed out the elite from the labor come on now come on. like come on and they haven't been revamped anytime that not i know all. of not at all they, they are still the same as they've been for. They just call long. something different. Let, let's do. So, mm -hmm. so let's talk about that. So we know that the way standardized tests are just doesn't work. Yeah. So what do you think are some alternative assessments or tasks that we can administer to students that will be an alternative to these tests that we know are counterproductive for them? An alternative is not to have them. <laughs> um, that would be my my ultimate goal or my all that's my freedom dream. Sure. One of my freedom dreams is to get rid of standardized tests. Um, just because, like what I just said, you know, they were made to weed out the elite from the labored. And it makes us assume that we have both elite and labored within one classroom when we should be assuming that all students can, right? So if they want to be labored, let them be labored. I had a student that was like, I want to own a restaurant. I, I want to be, I want to be cooking in my restaurant, et cetera, et cetera. Get it. I'm going to make you the best daggone cook. And, and we're going to talk about what it's like to own a business, et cetera, et cetera. I've had students that want to be neurologists. I mean, it's, it, it runs the gamut, right? So I feel like our assessments in the, within the, actual, if we have to talk about how we would do it in the current system, I, I would love to see cross-curricular testing. Why do I have to have my kids take four different standardized tests? Mm -hmm. Why do they have to take ELA and math and science in fifth and eighth, at least in Ohio, and then also social studies? Why can they not come up with some way to have our students show what they've learned in a cumulative way through projects or through capstones. That's what we do in college. If we can trust that grown people, and I can tell you, I've done a few capstones. I've got two master's degrees, two bachelor's degrees, and I've done some capstones. And I'm gonna tell you right now, 
it wasn't always my best work, right? So <laughs> there's a way there. The tests are not, they're not giving us what we think it's giving us, right? No. We're spending a lot of time on data. So one- And money. A lot of money, but that's what it is. It's capitalism. It's based sure. on capitalism. So if I tell you that I have a, a group of kids that are so far behind and oh my gosh, then guess what? They're going to be chomping at the bit with their remediation practices and their books and their programs and all of this stuff in RTI, even though it shows that that doesn't... Sh Research shows us so many, so much. I, I could run them off mm -hmm. that RTI programs do not work. They don't. We need to find a way to expose students to, well, tap into prior knowledge within the classroom to really accelerate their learning while they're getting on grade content, on grade level content. Because if we continue to perpetuate this cycle of like, oh, you're behind, let me go back a couple grades. Guess what? When they get to next grade, they're going to be back a couple grades. When they get to the next grade, they're going to be back a couple grades. Mm. So when do we when does the book stop? Right. And it's got to stop with us. So with assessments, I just really I feel wholeheartedly that they either need to be cross curricular and cut down, because right now I think um, I read a study on great city schools. They did 66 districts. Students take what was it? an average of 112 standardized tests from pre-K to 12. That's a hot mess. That's that's too much. Too, that's much. too much. That's a hot mess. And they continue to tell us the same thing. Continue to tell us the same thing. And we continue to look at it. So when I'm looking at assessments or I'm looking at data with teachers in my district, I really try to humanize, humanize that data by saying that data point is somebody's baby, it's somebody's child. We all want better for our kids. I don't care what you think about the parent or how much they show up to school or how much they don't or whatever, we all want better. So make your assessments at least in class that you use really, really tailored to your kids. So you said a whole lot there. I but did. There's, but there's a, but which is great. There's a lot of great stuff there that I wanna kind of pick apart. But you mentioned something about prior knowledge, how we should be teaching prior knowledge, but still staying on track with the grade level skills that they need to learn. And I know for me personally, that was something that I, that I struggled with. Yeah, it's not easy to do. It's not. And I and I taught eighth grade math, so you have to imagine I'm supposed to be preparing these students to go to algebra one, to go to algebra one in high school as freshmen. I've been there. And they're yeah. coming in three, four, in some cases, five grade levels behind with their Ooh. skills. Yeah. We're talking students struggling to do two column subtraction. Facts. With borrowing. Students who have a phobia for fractions, especially when that reciprocal flips. Like, <laughs> like. <laughs> Real or when they have to get a common denominator, it, it's out the window, yes. Real trauma. So, mm -hmm. you know, being a, a math coach, right, when you are going into teachers' classrooms and observing their instructional practices, how much time are you focusing on how they're able to um, establish a balance between teaching that prior knowledge, the skills that the students need to know, to um, address the gaps, but also keep in track with the pacing that they need to, um, you know, do in order to be prepared for these tests that we've already established do not really matter. Yep. So that's a that's a huge question, and I will tell you, it is hard. I taught yeah. seventh and eighth grade math. My seventh graders they they looped up with me, so I had them two years, and I will oh, tell you, eighth grade. Eighth grade was better because I had those relationships. Okay. You know, they were the relationships were solid. They trusted me. I always told them, I said, look, math class, sometimes, especially when you have anxiety, is like a trust fall. Mm. And I'm telling you right now that I'm going to catch you. So even if you can't do something right now, I promise you, if you try for me, if you show up and show out, I'm going to be back there with my arms held out and I will make sure to catch you. So. I cannot say enough. I know that it sounds cliche, but relationships matter. Yeah. And the trusting relationship matters in mathematics. They have to trust that what you're giving them 
if they don't get it the first time or the fifth time or the 17th time, you're going to give it to them a little different each time to see what works and not blame them. Oh, well, you're just not listening. Are you even listening to me? Why is your head down? Why did you, why is your hoodie on? Policing the wrong things. So that would be the first thing that I would say. But I would also say that when I'm working with teachers now, we are constantly looking at critical areas of focus because standards matter. They really do. When you look at the standards and you look at the skills that were, are within the standards. So I learned this at an Unbound Ed conference and it blew my mind where I, we broke down the standard. We understood the skills and we understand what is it asking us to do, right? So when we build the curriculum guides every year for our teachers to follow, the curriculum guides, literally they tell you, oh, well, you, this is paced to be 14 days long. And you're like, you're at day 21 and you're kicking and screaming like, I'm so behind, my kids are so behind. So there's a couple strategies that I've given teachers and tried to help them with. Okay. Stations, stations should be happening in, even in middle and high school. They shouldn't stop at fourth grade, y'all. Like, let's keep up some stations. Because I can be working with a small group of students that can't do that two digit subtraction or are still struggling with those decimals, still struggling with whatever. Then I can have a, another group of kids that's working on a project. I have another group of students that are on Desmos working on some like stuff. And then another group that's doing some manipulatives. That's another thing that should still be in middle school and high school. Give the kids some something, some manipulatives, something some to action do. Action tiles. Yes. You know, like, listen. <laughs> Yeah, we assume that they know all of that. And it's like, who knows what happened in fourth grade? I had a baby, her her father um, ended up being arrested and, and, and jailed when she was in fourth grade and she was a daddy's girl. She could not remember anything that she learned from the middle of fourth grade until she got to me. Mm. Literally told me that. She said, I don't know what you're gonna do with me. I don't even remember what I've learned since fourth grade. I'm like, oh, don't worry. We're gonna, we gonna get you there. Ooh. You, you so, threw in the manipulatives now. Yeah. And and this goes back to what we said about the importance of building conceptual knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Now, do you believe that um, the fact that we just have advanced technology and all these different apps like iReady, for instance, oh, I Excel I like Math, I like them too. Don't get me wrong. I like them, but I feel like there are certain teachers who use the computers as stations. Like, okay, go on Khan Academy, spend 30 minutes there. That's a station mm -hmm. as opposed to, all right, now nah, let's get these tiles, okay? And let's let's work this thing out. Mm -hmm. Like, we're going to sit down together, let's work it out, right? Yeah. Or or just do the old-fashioned, you know, paper or pencil. Like, yeah. not saying that you have to do it all the time, but those still can function as stations if you plan accordingly. And I think- For sure. That may be just too much work for some teachers because they feel like that sense of urgency to get through the pacing of just all these standards. It's that and it's the the power. It's the power that structure. Too. We don't want to give up the control. But you know what? I, I love on teachers. That's really like what I like to do in my coaching role is to walk in and just really love on teachers the way that I would a, a student because teachers are hurting right now. There's a lot going on. So I get it. I get why they don't want to take on yet another thing because they're dealing with eighth graders are really fifth graders right now. They have literally no uh, the maturity that we we see from seventh to eighth grade. Some usually has not happened. Um, because of the pandemic, we've at least in our district, we were we were virtual for a whole year, then a half a year. And it's just been it's been a lot. So I get why they're not doing it. Um, I feel like they have a lot on their plate. And then we have really over tested. So, you know, we were pushing like a two week cycle of assessment, which is best practice. And I do believe in them. I do. But teachers didn't want to give up what they were doing before to try something new. Because it's hard to try something new. And I get it. You know, yeah. I'm not blaming anyone, but we've got to we've got to get out of our funk. And I don't know what that looks like or feels like or how that's going to happen. Um, but but we've got to figure out how we get out of this funk and get like back to some joy, you know, get get back to some joy in, in teaching and learning and trying new things. And I think we've over tested so much that the word assessment 
just has this permanent Ooh. negative connotation to it, right? Assessments can be joyful. Absolutely. An assessment, so when we think about assessments, we always think about the summative assessments. Mm -hmm. We don't always focus on the formative where it might be just a project. Yeah. It might even be just as simple as an exit ticket. Yes. Before they leave your class. You know, like there are ways in which you can still assess without feeling like it's, you know, this, you know, heavily pressurized thing that you have to administer, you know, mm -hmm. to students. So I think we need to revisit our relationship that we have yep. with assessment. Pretty much a lot of teachers. That, and that goes beyond the math classroom. And celebrations for them. So my cousin, um, Keisha, Keisha Woods Porcher, um, Dr. Porcher, she is she came to visit my classroom one day. Right. She just mm -hmm. popped up and we just happened to be taking a quiz like she popped up. She was in town. She lives in Jersey, but she popped up. She was in town. She brought me flowers. My kids were taking a, te a quiz. When the quiz ended, the last person turned in their little quiz. It was only and I don't do a, a billion questions because if you can do it once, you can do it a million times. So like the quiz was like five questions or something. Everybody turned it in. I hit play on, I think it was Moneybag Yo or somebody at that point, <laughs> Lil, Lil Uzi Vert, somebody. And the kids jumped up. They were on their chairs dancing like, yeah, we did that. Yeah, we did that. And Keisha was like blown. She was like, I have never seen such joy for kids that just took a test. Like, I'm like, girl, we, we celebrate here. I don't care if you got one right or all five right. You did something right. And I can work with where you need, as long as you show me your thinking, not your work, because I don't care about that. You can draw me a picture about what you're thinking, but I want to know your thinking so that I can make it real for you. So for instance, I had a student that just could not conceptualize unit rate. And I'm like, okay. And I knew he was fo a football fan. I said, you and your boys are going to go to the Bengals game. Okay. You and four of your boys. Your dad gets off of work early, so he's going to go and buy your tickets for all five of you. How do you know how much your boys are supposed to cash up you back? He was like, well, I mean, whatever the total is, I'm going to divide it by five. I was like, that's the unit rate. He was like, what? Like, I mean, it was, <laughs> it was crazy. Like, I, I mean, and it was just like, that's the fun that I like to have. I like to have fun in class. I like to make it real for, for the students. And students don't feel bad in my class to be like, I don't get it. Because I'm going to be like, that, okay, well, let's talk about it. And that's the key right there is letting them know that you're going to stick by them no matter what. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you get that answer wrong 100 times. I'm going to stick by you when you do that the 101st time. Like, <laughs> that's right. That, that's the real right there. That's but right. I actually have um, a quick story. So, you know, I teach eighth grade. So mm -hmm. they're learning about functions, right? Oh, I love functions. Okay, uh, basically, yeah. you know, input, output, domain, range. What's a function? What's not a function? So when I was explaining it to them, just the basics, they're like, well, Mr. Sarfamensa, how do you know when, you know, something's not a function? So literally, I use the example, now mind, these are eighth graders, so I use the example of like boyfriends and girlfriends, right? So I okay. said, listen, you see if, you see the brother right here? If that brother got two if, oh if that brother not being faithful and he got two two girlfriends right here, that's when you know something wrong. <laughs> In other words, it's not a function. But if brother or you know sister being faithful, one to one, right? We good. Ah! And they're like, yo. I'm gonna steal then, that. All I did was video. And then it spun off into stories. Like, okay, I don't need to know all these stories. <laughs> You, you get the you now you know what a function is and then that's when you start to really bring in the the math language the okay what's the domain what's the range and you start to do those translations but it always starts with culture absolutely yes yes that's dr april baker bell told me that the kids been knowing we just got to let them know the way that they know and then we we build the the academic language on top of their cultural language. Yeah, but yeah, yeah you, you gotta do so much. Like there was actually <laughs> one time where, like, I did some crazy stuff. Like you know those times when you ask a question that requires some critical thinking. Yep. Kids be silent, 
And I'm not saying that it's right or wrong, but I knew that it worked for me. Literally, I got out my wallet. Oh, I got a dollar bill. Man, <laughs> them hands shot up so quick. And them kids were trying. And it, it's crazy. Like you, And they'll give you the, the best answers, too. And it's like, oh, no. Nope. And then another kid will raise a hand up. Nope, you didn't get it. Uh, nope, nope. Next thing you know, everybody's raising their hands. You had kids who have already got two, three trials at it, still ain't get it. Mm-hmm. And then it starts from that to grabbing the textbook and trying to look for the answers. I'm like, see, this is what I'm talking about, right? And I, I just give out a dollar. So here you go. You know what? I have a fourth grade teacher. Um, her name is Miss Penn, fourth and fifth. She allows, like when she's reviewing a topic that she's already went over, she has kids, as they, as they master it, they get to put tutor next to their name. So they get to get up and move around the room and be the expert and help their peers. I said, girl, that's what I'm talking about. Like, that's the type of stuff that we need to be doing is, is really positioning them as experts. Right. And I think what's also important is when we do celebrate growth, right, it's not always about the student who is the highest performer. Yeah. Sometimes it could be the student who's achieved just the most growth, right? Yep. Who's put in the most effort. So, like, when I used to award student of the months, it wasn't always, like, the A student. It hardly ever was the A student. It was, like, the C student who was busting their behind who may not have been completing their homework assignments, but they got on a good two, three-week streak, showed some growth, and it's like, yeah. all right, you know what? I see you. For sure. So I'm going to reward you, right? And and I think it's important that we, we look at those students because we already know that the A student is always going to be the A student. They're going to keep rocking with you from September all the way through to June. Yeah. It's the other students who you really got to focus on. You got to focus on all of them, but those other students in particular, they need a special kind of attention. And, and there are so many things that you have to do just to get them to, to try. Yeah. So when you, when you talk about, um, for instance, this idea of a uh, productive struggle, right? Okay. We have this problem that we need to do. You and I both know that math is all about trial and error, right? And sometimes through those errors, we get the greatest lessons. Yes. But our students are so conditioned to believe in getting the right answer that you got to penetrate through that conditioning to get them to see that the real learning happens when you make the mistakes. Yep. Like, th that's the real learning. <laughs> yep. Yep. Agreed. Ah, for sure. So let's talk about CRT. Ooh. We, we go out to talk about CRT. Now, you're in Ohio, and there's been some, there have been some things going on in Ohio, <laughs> um, yeah. just like a lot of other states throughout the nation, and it's just getting to a point where, man, this is just getting ridiculous, you know, with these anti-CRT laws that yeah. are still uh, popping off. Now, I'm not sure what's going on there, um, but... Uh, are they having y'all post instructional materials on websites? Is is that the mandate? Like, what's the nature of the the bills out there in Ohio? So there there is some some legislation that's been put forth to um, discourage, I would say, educators from talking about uh, anything that may make students feel inferior in the classroom. Mm. Which is funny to me because that's what we've been doing to doing to black and brown kids for centuries. But Hello? okay, go off. <laughs> um, I will say that in my district, we actually have a written anti-racism policy, and we have an, a written equity policy. It's our it's board policy, and Cincinnati Public is, I think, the third largest public school system in Ohio. So that's a huge thing. So we're definitely watching to see what what comes about because we've empowered our teachers to be able to have conversations through um, different exposure to different literature, understanding why we're teaching some mathematical concepts and why it's important to understand just kind of some of those basics of criticality as it pertains to teaching math. 
so I'm hoping my fingers are crossed that nobody mandates anything, um, for, but leaves it up to their districts, I guess, which is the best case scenario in this scenario. The best case scenario overall would be just leave us alone. Like do your, right. <laughs> leave us alone. Like <laughs> Start your own school system with the kid, with your, with your own children or whatever you need to do. Like move, start your own country. <laughs> I don't know what y'all need to do, but leave us alone. Let us let us do our thing. And and staying on critical race theory for a second, um, I know that per, I know personally when this issue first came about, I was like, "What? Like I don't know what that is." Uh, my wife, you know, she knew a little bit about critical race theory, but I was like, "What? What? What is that?" But then I started to read up on it. Um, got the big thick red book. Yep. Which, <laughs> I, I mean, the print like this small. Yep. There's a lot in there. Very intimidating, but a lot of great knowledge in there. So you know, I actually got the primer. So I read the primer because the primer is like the Cliff Notes version of it. Yeah. And you know, from there you're able to get an idea of what the foundational concepts are, right? So that's how I've been able to build on that. Right. And been talking with folks who are critical race scholars and have been doing it for years. So we know about critical race theory, you know, it provides us with a lens to help us understand why our students are marginalized and dehumanized within these institutions. Yep. That's all it is in a nutshell. So I'm wondering from you, how does having a foundational understanding of critical race theory as a math teacher um, help us in providing a better educational experience for our students? This is probably my favorite question. And I'm going to, this is the reason why I think this is that, that I feel like this is my favorite question is because a lot of K through 12 teachers have thrown it up to say that that's not what we're teaching. We're not teaching that in K through 12. But the thing is, is we should have that in the back of our minds. And the reason why we should have that in the back of our minds and we should know what it is and we should know how to apply it to our craft is because math truly can be an oppressive tool. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand the history behind how math has been used to oppress our communities and understand that math does have some... It's baked in racism, just like anything else. I know that, you know, the folks on Twitter are going to come after me. Oh, woke math, this, and how is math racist? Two plus two is four. Yeah, all that is, is keep all that because it, I remain unbothered. Because to me, I want my students to walk out of my seventh or eighth grade classroom knowing that if they know just the basics about interest, they will have less of a chance of being taken advantage of when they go to buy their first home, when they go to buy their first car. Mm. If, if my students walk out of class understanding um, their voting rights and how districts are drawn and gerrymandering is disgusting in Ohio. So we actually looked at our gerrymandering and how our maps are drawn and they're like, but all the white folks live over there. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. So that's why this one guy, um, Steve Shabbat, he keeps getting elected because he has this base and because the districts are drawn that way. And they're like, what? So we literally just, I feel like math is part of liberating us and freeing us because I understand that it is built upon this racist stone that everything else is built upon. And the only reason I know that is because I've used criticality or my lens yes. to really look in, in deeply and not just see it as two plus two equals four. And the fact that people come after us and say two plus two equals four, you're like making my case for me, you know, that it, it's important. Right. And all that is true. And I also think that as educators, we need to reframe our um thinking around critical race theory in the sense that you don't you don't have to be a critical race scholar to understand how to utilize critical race theory in your classroom as a practitioner. Yep. 
You just have to know what the tenets are and just teaching that spirit. Yep. You know, when we talk about things such as the counter narrative, counter storytelling, when we talk about interest convergence theory, like if you understand how these things apply, not just in the math classroom, but just in our school systems, that alone may be enough for you to do a lot to change how things are in your school systems. But the way, but the narrative that's out there is that we can't really do much about it because this is what is taught in universities. You got to be a law student to understand what all this is. Yeah, I got to read that thick behind red book before I could do something about it. I have not read that yet. Uh, I just, I wish I had that type of time. Um, but again, like you, I like to talk to people. I've yeah. talked to scholars that, um, that find them, find critical race theory to be one of their, their things that they're, they know that's their, no their, their knowledge. So I'd like to talk to them about that, but I will say even something as small as the story that only, you know, have you ever had your students draw me a math person? And they're mm. always like this person with a bow tie on and they do it in science too, right? And so just that story that like this old white man is the only people, you know, the only type of person that does math, that is a narrative. And that's a narrative that a lot of our students carry. So the fact that we would even put something else in front of them is actually... <laughs> Sorry, teachers that are hanging up black mathematicians. <laughs> you're actually telling a counter narrative. You're you're telling a counter counter story. Um, so I, I'm hoping to see that continue, and even digging a little deeper to find um, narratives within their own communities. So, like one thing that I have my students do is interview another person throughout the year at one point or another. Ask them, how do you do math in your job right now? How was math in school? Mm. Are, do you consider yourself a math person? What did you learn in school that you apply in your job right now? And I have people that have even stay-at-home moms that will tell them how they use math to bake, to cook dinner. And they're like, dang, I never even thought about it like that. I only think about math when I think about money. I'm like, but that's not even it. That math is everywhere, you know. It so, is. yeah. No, uh, it definitely is. I mean, we tell people that you know the GPS system that we use was practically invented by a black woman. Yep. <laughs> They're like, what? For real? <laughs> like, yep. And everybody uses a GPS system. Whether you everybody. got a Waze, whether you got a Google Maps, you're using a GPS system to drive around your neighborhood. Absolutely. I don't care who you are. A black woman is responsible for that. Black but, women are responsible for a lot of great things. I'm just yes, they are. Plug in there too. <laughs> yes, they are. Especially during uh, this uh, Women's History Month, we definitely got to center our black woman. That's right. Sure. Um, also, black trans woman. Let's let's thank you. Yes, in, you, know, you know. Yes, um, you know we not like. Come on, like Marsha P. Johnson. Like we not gonna center her as well. Some of your <laughs> liberation rests on her shoulders. Come on so now. I'm gonna need y'all to recognize. For yes. real, but yeah. that, that's a whole nother topic. Absolutely, another whole hour. Nother topic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ooh. So I got one last question before we uh get to our lightning round. Okay. And this is around teacher preparation. So you're a math coach. You've yep. gone through your own teacher prep. I've gone through my own teacher prep. And one thing that I know for sure is my teacher prep program did not train me to be the math teacher I am today. The reason why I'm the math teacher I am today is because of trial and error, making mistakes, recognizing how I was imposing harm racially, but also social emotionally on my students. I had mm -hmm. to come to that epiphany myself, not my institution. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in knowing from you, what are some measures that teacher prep programs can take in supporting pre-service math teachers and developing anti-racist practices? Because I think it has to start there before they get to the classroom. Yeah. 
I would say definitely as a coach, I can teach you how to teach math all day long, but I cannot teach you how to build beautiful, authentic, strong, trusting relationships with youth. I, I just, I mean, I might be able to teach you that, but but you've got to have some intrinsic motivation to do that, right? Yes. I feel like the first thing that especially PWIs need to do, predominantly white institutions for those listeners that may not know, what PD, PWIs need to do is really examine themselves first and figure out how do we fix ourselves so that we can model anti-racism? Because we know statistically our teaching force is highly white, female, from affluent or privileged backgrounds. And how do I expect them to be automatically anti-racist when I, they've never had a model and they're coming from a, a system or a university that perpetuates exactly what we don't want them to do? Sure. So you're modeling racism, but also touting the fact that you want to produce anti-racist people. That just, it's, you know, the math ain't mathing for that, for me. Mm. So I feel like universities need to stop and, and care less about the capitalism um, and elitism that they push and care a little bit more about the product that they are putting in front of other people's babies. Those are people's children, their babies that they want great things for. Um, and I'm not interested in putting any more just warm bodies in front of anybody's kids. Like if you're not there with a mindset that the, the kids in front of you are just like your own, if you're not going to teach them as if they are, then I would rather you just like pick a different career or go somewhere else. There it is. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Could not agree with you more. Uh, but Crystal, we can go on about this for, for hours, honestly. <laughs> honestly. But let's get to the lightning round to wrap let's things go. up because, you know, we about to approach the hour. Yep. And this is just a way for the audience to get to know you a little bit. Uh, got some quick hitter questions. So here's the first one. Okay. Favorite math concept? To learn stats to teach linear equations, slope. Boom. Most difficult math concept to learn and slash or teach. Operations with fractions and integers or rational numbers altogether. It just seems like it's a whole miss. Really? I, yeah. I thought rational numbers was pretty easy because, you know. Fractions? Well, rational numbers were fractions. Okay. All right. That's, like fractions, that's cool. decimals, um, re uh, repeating num. Well, not repeating numbers, but those are those are pretty easy. But. Integers, like students just do not get the adding and subtracting negatives. They, I mean, it takes a while. It takes a minute <sighs> and some spiraling. Man, that's that's always tough. Like, especially <laughs> when we're doing those integer rules. Like, hold up. Like, I used to do the whole thing, for instance, with uh, if you are uh, subtracting by a negative integer, you know, hey, those two, those two minus signs, they marry to become a plus sign. Like I was doing yes. stuff like that, which technically you don't want to do that. I could have just said, well, if you're subtracting by a negative integer, it's the same as adding by the inverse. Yes. But they're not going to say that. It's saying no, not negative. Right. I, I mean, I've tried it all. I'm telling you, one of these days I'm going to crack it and that's going to be my claim to fame. Oh, uh, I've been trying to crack that for <laughs> years. Still haven't quite got to that point. So you're not alone. <laughs> All right. Um, a book you're currently reading, if there is any. I'm always reading. Right now, I'm reading and leading a book study on Choosing to See by Dr. Seda and Kendall Brown. It is absolutely phenomenal. It's a practitioner's book. You can pick it up and use it. It's um, all about equity in the math classroom. All right. Shout out to Dr. Pamela Seda and um, yes. Kendall Brown. That's yep. a book that is on, on cue for me, so... Gotta it's good. You'll that. like it. You'll like All it a right. lot. It's an easy read too. Yeah. All right. Nice. And um, if you can invite three influential figures to dinner, dead or alive, who would they be? Okay. This was really hard for me. Um, Angela Davis, Kimberly Crenshaw, and Gloria Latson Billings, and we would call it a Black Brilliance brunch instead of a dinner. So holla at me, ladies. I'm ready for a Black Brilliance brunch. <laughs> 
Oh, I love it. <laughs> that's just that's just gonna be a dope table. Just a dope table. I think so too. Yes. <laughs> Crystal, thank you so much for taking some time to holler at me and to engage in some math talk. Absolutely. This was um this this was this was joy for me. So I appreciate it. Appreciate the conversation. I appreciate the the platform, all of that good stuff. So I'm gonna keep watching, keep watching out for you. I appreciate that. And let the viewers and listeners know how they can connect with you either on social media or through your website. So yep, I'm Crystal M. Watson everywhere. Um, underscore on Twitter. I'm not on Facebook. I don't get on there. Uh, I do Instagram sometimes, but Twitter is the place to get me. And then my website is crystalmwatson.com. All right. And make sure y'all go to Crystal's website. She has a lot of services um, that she provides for schools, students, educators, all the above. So make sure y'all check her out. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. All right. You have a good rest of the day. You too. Ciao. All right, y'all. So we're about to close with another episode of Radical Math Talk. And as always, I wish you all good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are in the world. And we're going to do this again another time. Peace out, everybody.